Sometimes you have to talk to people. Can I say it? Like, it won't, yeah, because that's actually like, okay. <laughs> okay, I will start. So, uh, this is the last and the fourth, the fourth and the last lecture on algebraic number theory. Uh, so, I'm going to start uh, by recalling where we ended last time. So, we're about at the end, we're computing the ideal cluster of a particular, a particular ring of integer, namely Q adjoint square root of negative 14. Okay, so let's recall this. In this case, OF is B address square root of negative 14. And then uh, Minkowski bound in this case equal to square root of uh, 56. This is the uh, absolute value of the discriminant. Times a four over pi to the one for the complex embedding. Times another factor which is two factorial over two to the two. So these are degrees. So these these three twos they are degrees. And you, you punch into the calculator you get around four times seven six. So. The result is, is suffices to look at factorization so of primes equals two and three, or sort of any number that's smaller than this. Four is sort of, you know, four is two. So doesn't really matter. Okay, so now. Uh, let's recall that two factors of two comma square root of negative fourteen squared, and three factors as uh, three comma square root of negative this plus one and three comma. Okay, so these ideals factorization. So the goal is to prove. That the ideal class group of OF is a secret group of order four. So basically, the four element will be represented by the principal ideals, uh, the ideal class of one, and the, this ideal uh, ideal class of is two comma root of negative fourteen, and these two ideals here. So what we will show is that first of all. This ideal, uh, two comma root of negative fourteen, uh, the root of negative fourteen, that's not a not a principal ideal. It's not a principal ideal, and therefore it will represent a non-trivial element in the class group order two. Secondly, this element will. I will show that it represents an element of order four in the group. So in a second group, so that really means that I want to show that if I square this element, so that's the same in same ideal class of this ideal class which has order two. Yeah, in the group of order four, you square the element with order four, you get the element of order two. Let's do the two steps. So these are just boils down to some sort of explicit calculation, which we do now. So for one, suppose not. Suppose it, suppose this ideal two comma root of negative fourteen is the principal for some alpha in V. Okay. So this is sort of a typical argument to use in the case of a. Uh, Imaginary mm -hmm. quadratic field, what you look at is you take the norm of the ideal. On this side, you get the norm of the ideal generated by alpha, 
And we said, uh, if it's a traceable ideal, that's just basically just the usual norm of the element. Of course, it's better to have absolute value, but in this case, actually, the norm is always positive, so you don't have to add absolute value. Okay. So now I have to explain what's the norm of the, uh, the first ideal, 2, comma, root of negative 14. But you kind of see this from here. Uh, via this factorization, you know that the norm of 2, comma, 14, if you square that, remember the norm is multiplicative, so therefore that's the same as norm of the ideal generated by 2. And that's just basically the norm of the number 2. The two in the under two embeddings are just versus back to two. You get two times two, which is four. And therefore, this norm is two. Okay, two comma. Sorry. So this is the idea of two. So the norm of the idea of two comma root of negative fourteen is just two because the square of the norm is 4. On the other hand, this equals to uh, the, the actual norm of this alpha. Let's assume this alpha looks like, oh, sorry, too low. Let's assume this alpha looks like a plus b times root to the negative 14. Then if you take the norm of this, it's going to be a plus b root to the negative 14, and it's complex conjugates. And this is the same as a squared plus 14b squared. Now you see that you have some equation which looks like 2 equals a squared plus 14b squared. There's no solution. There's no integer solution. No integer solution. I mean, 2 is not a square plus 14 times another square. No solution. So that implies that this is not a principle. Okay. Basically, for imaginary quadratic field, for ideal, you should, if you want to show some ideal is not a principle ideal, the best way is to show that, you know, just take the norm and show that the norm, the, there's no element of that norm. That's usually the other case. Okay? So let's do the other one. Do the other. That looks a little scary. It's okay. It's okay. So I want to do something slightly different. So you want to show that, you know, you're in an order of four group, right? You want to show the square of the order of four elements uh, is equal to the. Order two L. And you want to show this as equivalent to show that if you multiply this thing with this, you get the uh, principal idea class. That's the same thing because because this guy is, is has order two. If you want to show something is equal to that, it's equivalent to show that that thing times it is equal to zero. It, because, it, because it, again, this ID class is the same as its inverse. So now it's just a, a plain calculation. Uh, stretch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's a good way? There's no good way. Let's do it. <laughs> Not a pretty part of the So okay. Well, okay. Let me do the square first. Square is that remember that even if you square an ideal is not square, you don't just take the square of the generators. You have to take pairwise product of the generators. So you have nine here. You have their product three times. Let's write three plus three root of negative fourteen, and the square of this one. Uh, so that's negative 13 plus 2 times, well, 
I mean, now the prettiest memory of synth. Uh, then I'm trying to decide whether I just want to take another product or. Let me simplify a little bit as I have in the notes, maybe. So, okay, so when you have these two, if you have two elements in the ID, you can, you know, take their difference as you wish. So I can take the difference. So let this one to subtract this, the second track, the third one from the second one. So I get 16 plus root of 14 in there. And now I can, uh, when I have 9 in this, I can probably get negative 2. I mean, basically the idea is you want to get something, some number looks smaller. That, that has a better chance to be the generator. Okay? So now I want to say, okay, this, this element, so let me just write it down here. So you definitely have 9 here, and negative 2 plus root of negative 14. You definitely have this two here. And I want to say that when you have these two, you can forget about the, the more complicated ones. Uh, let's maybe just do this calculation in your head. So if you multiply this one by 2, you get minus negative 4 plus 2 times root of negative 14. And over here, you have negative 13 plus 2 times root of negative 14. So their difference is negative 9, which is on this first factor here. I'm not sure if I want to write that part. Uh, so this part you have the negative 13 plus 2 times. So it's a negative 9 plus 2 times. And same for the other one. Uh, that's equal to, well, you have 3 times this. Probably add another 9 and you get this one. You can guess, it shouldn't be too complicated. Okay, so you have this. Basically, you use this thing and simplify things to a very relatively small coefficient of L, uh, number, and you kind of just get that that number will generate back everything. And over here, you're not supposed to get it principal ideal because you know that you're just squaring this, and you're squaring an element in the degree four group, uh, order four group. You should not get the identity element in the ideal class group. So therefore, whatever you you get in here should not be principal. The next step you get principal. You multiply all four of the elements together. I only see three products. Oh yeah, because the square is A B equals B A. Supposed to be four. Right, you, over here you have a square like mm -hmm. A B is square is equal to A square. So well supposed it should be A B B and B square, right? Yeah. It's really the same thing. That's why you have three. Got it. The next one will have four. Yes. The next one will have four. Not that I ever like that very much. <laughs> uh, well, I guess this is a lie. What's this? Okay. And uh, what's the good way? Uh, okay, using these two. You multiply this by 4, and then subtract 4 times that from this, you get 16 plus that. And using these two, you get really get negative 2 plus. So basically, I did, let me just say, at the end of the day, after a long discussion, you realize this is a principal idea generated by negative 2 times plus root of negative 4. Okay? I guess this is one way to kind of see. Uh, by brutal computation. If you're not happy with this sort of this complicated computation, you may be able to kind of uh, know ahead of time what you might be getting. So here's what you do. You take the norm and see what happens. Right, I mean, let's just go back to here of the factorization. So this one has norm four. This one has norm nine. Right? And that means basically this factor has norm 2, and this one of these will have norm 3. I think that's something you would probably expect, anyways. And so, therefore, over here, we do this computation, the norm would be 3 squared times 2, which is equal to 18. 
And if the claim were true, this 18 will be a principal ideal. Right? So this would be equal to, I mean, how do we do the principal ideal here? A principal ideal will look like something like a squared plus, the normal principal ideal should be a squared plus 14b squared. So this should be a squared plus 14b squared. So you can probably guess ahead of time that the generator would be, so whatever computation n will be either equal to, right? so I would guess either negative 4 plus 14 or 2 plus 14. Of course, I don't know which one I will be getting, but probably one of the two. So this will help, maybe, you know, at least psychologically support you to go through the <laughs> <laughs> computation. And also at the same time, you know, check for any sort of potential sort of mistakes. I guess, for example, here, we compute the square of this one, you see a negative 2 plus uh, root of negative 14, that's a, somehow a good, a good psychological support. You know, we're getting in the, in the right direction. Just keep doing. <laughs> you know, you, you see something that looks like what you're gonna get at the end. Yes. How did you make that guess? What guess? When you're like, oh, it's either. Um, oh, we just solved this. A ten equals a squared plus fourteen b squared. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about it. You know, like if b can't be zero, right? B can't be too large. I mean, the, the best is b equals one. If b is two, that will be at least four fifty something. You know, too large. So b has to be plus minus one. So a in that case just plus minus two. The size of the room, like you, you can have plus minus, and, you know, for ideal generation, it will be the same thing. So, two, two things. So, you, these are probably something you're going to end up with. Okay? It's a bit computational. Yes? So how do you know it's cyclic and not like C2 cross C2? That's a very good question. So, uh, <laughs> So oh, yeah, so uh, maybe maybe starting from here. So, so yeah, how do you know it's? You actually, I don't know. I don't <laughs> so basically, by guessing. So first of all, when you look at this situation, right? So here, here's how I would think about it. Look at the situation. You have something square equals to principal. So the first question I want to think is: what, Is that a element of order? Is that the principal ideal or element order two, right? So, uh, so that boils down the question whether there's an element of the norm two. And clearly, there's no element of the norm two because a squared plus fourteen b squared can't be two. So, so that's definitely element order two. Now, I have some additional things I have to consider. These two, and obviously these are not principal because same argument: a squared plus fourteen squared b squared cannot be three. So now you want a square. If you think of, can the square be a principal ideal? So you ask whether this could be a principal ideal or not. Well, first of all, this is it's very unlikely it's going to be the same as three because three factor is this, and this ideal doesn't look like this one. Okay, and it could be some other crazy, you know, generated by some other crazy algebra integers. Well. Again, you look at this a squared plus 14 squared, uh, 14 b squared. It can't be equal to 9 either, except unless a equals 3 and b equals 0. If b, uh, well, there's no, no other possibility. So if it were a principal ideal, it would have to be 3. Right, I mean, it's not that difficult to show that it's actually not the ideal generated by 3. So you know that this is not going to be principal. So I guess, you know, if you look at group of order smaller than equal to four, there are not many options. And you also have an element of order two, so basically you're all, only choosing between single group order four and Z mod two plus Z mod two. Yeah. I, I, also, also this one square is not a principal idea, so Z mod two. That's why I was asking how, that yeah. was pretty much my question. Yeah, yeah. If, the, if the group is a bit larger, like somewhere around the size of 10, I think I would just give up. <laughs> 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 Sorry, not him up. Ask say. <laughs> Compute the class group for me, please, please, please. <laughs> Make the computer program do it for you. Yes, yes. That's why we have we say. Or you know, we can do other subject of mathematics. <laughs> Just give up. <laughs> okay? Good?
what do you think about kids as a god? <laughs> Tell the people not to study number theory. <laughs> okay, so now we now we will talk about the ideal class group. Now I want to talk about another very important important arithmetic information about the ring of integers, then like the units in here. So this is all the elements in OF, such that you can find another element. You have, you have the multiplication inverse, so basically. So. Yeah. <coughs> you can find the multiplication inverse. You can invert it. Okay? And uh, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna explain, prove this in a minute. So that's the same as element in the rate of integers and its norm being plus or minus one. This may be another way to see it. Okay. Let's check this. If I have an, in, I have an algebra integer such that uv equals one, then I can take the norm of both sides. But the norm of f of integer, they're all integers. Yeah. So when you have two integers multiplied to one, it better be plus or minus one. <laughs> so uh, norm of u must be one. Oh, sorry. This is a terrible record. Why did I write this? Number cannot be equal to both one and negative one. Okay? So, I mean, conversely, you can sort of do the same thing. Uh, I guess I don't have enough information. Anyway, so conversely, what you want to do is you want to you know that norm of u is plus, plus or minus 1. Uh, then w what you note is that somehow the norm of u, uh, well, divided by u, first of all, this is a product of all other embeddings. This will be an algebraic integer in the algebra closure, because this is a product of all the other embeddings of the algebra integer. And on the other hand, it belongs to f cross, because this is just, you know, 1 over u. 1 over u always exists in, in f. So, uh, so, so the fact that if you take an algebra integer, whether it's in the same field or not, if it's in the field, then it's automatically that belongs to OF. So plus minus one. So therefore, uh, somehow the inverse of U actually lives in OF. Wait, did, why did you say it had to be algebraic integer? Uh, because it's an equal, because the norm of U is equal to the product other tau 2 of U. Tau N of the U. conjugates. Yeah, yeah, conjugates. These are all algebraic integers. Okay. Yeah, because they have, this, they have the same mm -hmm. minimal polynomial. Yeah, yeah, they have the same minimal polynomial, that's right. I know, but, but, the, but of course you don't know whether each one of them is going to be in F. But their product is, because a product is 1 over U, or plus minus, 1 over U. So it's both an algebra integer and in F, so therefore it's, uh, it's in, the, in, the, in all of that. So this is the equivalent description of the structure of all OF cross. Okay? So, the following might be a little bit abstract, but uh, anyways, I'll state the first of the theorem, and I'll explain how to understand the theorem and why why this is. I guess I'll give an application of the theorem, give a structure of this. So let so say 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 F has R one real embedding. And R two pairs of complex embeddings. Then the theorem of Dirichlet, a Dirichlet unit theorem, says that the group of 
of cross is finally generated, first of all. Uh, with. You can find at most R1 plus R2 minus 1. Let me write it multiplicative. Let me finish writing. Multiplicatively independent units of infinite order. The abstract code. So let me be a little bit more concrete than this. So this is you can write every unit in OF cross in the following form. There's some roots of unity. Times some u1 and 1. U r, r being this sum of real, real, real embedding is number of pairs of complex embeddings minus 1. And r. Or and 1. And r. So every unit is, you can. So basically, there exists some sort of so-called fundamental units u1 through ur. So the other units are just product of these, up to some power, up to uh, some roots of unity. Let's maybe give me some examples to start. Uh, so for example, f equals q with joint roots of two. Okay. In this case, OF cross is equal to plus or minus root of 2 minus 1 to the n. For n, oh, yeah. If you think about it, root of 2 minus 1 times root of 2 plus 1 is 2 minus 1 to the power. So therefore, root of 2 minus 1 is a unit. You, you, its inverse is inside of o, OF, in this case, I mean, and OF is the adjoint root of 2. So root of 2 minus 1 is a unit. Its inverse is in there. And all other units are actually powers of root of 2 minus 1, plus minus. So this root of 2 minus 1 is called the fundamental unit. And the general situation is that this group of units is equal to some sort of roots of unity, and then the rest is going to be sort of part of some particular fundamental units. And those fundamental units, there are precisely R of them, where the R is equal to R1 plus R2 minus 1. So in my case, I have a real quadratic field. So there are two real embeddings. Uh, there are no complex values. So therefore, r equals to r1 plus r2 minus 1, which is 1. So you have one generator in this case. Maybe I'll give it another example. This will be interactive. So I can do. So the keys was very helpful to give me this. So you have this. So this is a degree 4. Extension. So what are the embeddings? So this embeddings, four root of two can be go, can go to four root of two, or you know negative four root of two, or i times four root of two, or negative i times four root of two, right? 
So you have these two are the fortune two is finite. These two are going to the real embeddings. So these are a pair of complex. And this is real one, so there are basically two real embeddings and one pair of complex embeddings. And then the what you should be expecting is that R R should be equal to R1 plus R2 minus one. Or in my, in my case it's gonna be two. And uh, have this in an exercise. I don't remember the number. So, uh, sorry. So in this case, I think this is equal to, but I'm not sure. Completely. <laughs> so this u is going to be plus or minus one because you have. Uh, times the following. So you have two zeros. Oh, because I guess you know this is con this app contains the previous one, so any unit in the previous case will, will continue to be a unit over here. So you, anything which is look at root of two minus one powers, you're going to be a unit here, because I mean like this this contains the previous one, and you have something new. You can do uh, fourth root. Well, oh, you can do minus one. First order to two plus one. I think this is equal. If it's not equal, then it, it off by a small number. <laughs> I, I wrote it. I didn't prepare this, sorry. But you figure that more examples should be good. Excuse me? So, yeah. uh, how did we know that root two minus one is a fundamental unit in the first case? I did, pardon me? How did we know that root two minus one is a fundamental unit in the first case in Q root two? It looks pretty small. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't think of another number which looks smaller than that. It's, it's not that, I mean, in general, it's a difficult thing to determine whether a number is a fundamental unit or not. Okay. It, it requires some calculation. But in this case, it seems to be like, I mean, like, it, it, if, you, if you're not believed, you, you can say, okay, a plus b is root of 2 to so some power equals to, let's say, root of 2 plus 1. I mean, it's the inverse of that. I think it's unlikely you can find this another number a and b smaller than one and one, so that it works. So, yeah, so like oh, this is the smallest one you can look at. And for this real quadratic case, there is a good algorithm to compute the fundamental unit. I won't have to attempt to it's just use uh, continuous uh, continuous fractions to calculate the fundamental units in this case. But not now. Okay. Also, in the second case, uh, there should be some way to incorporate complex numbers. I, I is also a neutral unity model. Uh, uh, how should I put this? So, so, uh, how should I put this? so, this is a field. If you want to say to complex numbers, you're really specifying, you know, what it means to, like, you're really embedding your app into it. You choose the embedding already, right? So here I wrote four sorts of two. And then some of the embedding will become the real number, and then some of the embedding will become the complex numbers. So if that's how what you're what you're thinking. Yeah. Right. You it, it, it does not make I mean a priori it doesn't make sense for to say, you know, uh, an element in the number field whether it's complex or not. That that would not make sense. Unless you embed it, specify embedding. Other questions? Yes. Is uh, on the square, well, you have a square root of 2 minus 1 in the last line. Is that supposed to be a square root or a fourth root? Oh, maybe it's minus, you're saying? The very last line. 
Is this square root of 2 minus 1? This is what the LMDB has, LMFDB has, in case you... Maybe it is a negative, just be sure. Just, just to be safe. Just to be safe. Hmm? Uh, that was correct on the LMFDB, so this is, this is correct. What you have oh, I guess correct. you have one, you might get the other one. Anyway, so. the, the plus or minus sign doesn't matter. My question is four yeah. versus the square root. Yeah, yeah that's the just... square roots because it, the first one's contained in it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, what? I didn't quite get it. No question. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you can take n to be zero, and that's what we're saying. Uh, I, I, I know. We can discuss it later. Sorry. Okay. Other questions? Good. So anyway, so this is somehow something I hope to kind of get a good sense of, like the group of units, what it looks like. Okay. One of the typical applications of this is to uh, so-called health equation. Oh, I should say, sorry. Before that. Uh, where's my here? There we go. Sorry. So this theorem, I wrote here, I wrote here OF cross, right? Uh, the same works if I replace this OF cross by Z of R bar cross for any R by algebraic integer. So this works for, for Z R bar cross too. Uh, but of course you're going to get a different generator, a little bit different generator. So as long as somehow this thing in OF is some sort of finite index stuff, it's okay. So, so somehow this group, the, I guess the general group structure of OF cross is not that sensitive to the like this finite index thing because I mean, basically after all this is, looks like z to the r ah, times roots of unity called mu f so the roots of unity. <coughs> So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a free, it's a free group order of, uh, of rank R. If you change the free group of rank R by some finite index, it was still going to be a free group of rank R. Okay. So application. Uh, for application, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the penalty. I will not tell you how to express construct a bundle unit, but I just want to uh, mention that what we're doing. Sorry. Right. What we're doing is sort of interesting. I want to say, I want to take D to be square free. So, Pell's, Pell's equation. So, he, he studied this equation back in, I don't know, a long time ago. And of course, uh, the, in a modern point of view, what this is saying is that you, first of all, kind of factor this as. Told me to write y root. <laughs> I think really. <laughs> okay. And if you think about it more, it's really just same as. Uh, let me recall how we let's recall how we define the the units, right? The units are you know those elements O F which should be invertible. And those are the same as those elements of OF whose norm is plus or minus 1. So finding this basically the same as, well, pretty much the same as, almost maybe, same as finding uh, OF cross for F equal to Q joint root of D. Or rather, maybe finding uh, units in here. Then by Dirichlet here. I 
as I said, that this you don't have even if d is common to one mod four, you don't have to consider you know, z or d one over two. You can just say this, and there's some words. There's some fundamental unit. the fundamental unit. Okay? Uh, but of course, this, if you write this gamma zero as some sort of x zero plus root of d, uh, y zero root of d, then you know that norm of it In this case, x squared minus dy zero squared is equal to plus or minus one. I mean, somehow you don't quite know which whether it's going to be plus or minus a priori. So if it's like, let me say that if it can, this can happen that x squared minus dy squared is equal to negative one. But if that's the case, I can consider square of the fundamental zero. Let me just write it in. I mean, you take a square and you combine the terms. And then, say x squared is a fundamental solution. Basically, if you have something which solves the negative one Kelsey equation, just, just square the solution if you just definitely solve the Kelsey equation. So the general solution the Kelsey equation comes from you basically have the fundamental solution here and you raise to R power. And uh, I mean, basically, you write it as x r plus. I'm going to call it x one. I should call it, start calling it x one. Sorry. So x r y. So 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 this is a solution. And sometimes the Pelsey equation has a good structure that if you know one fundamental solution, you can get the rest of the solution. So, I get, well, of course, Pell at that time didn't know anything about algebraic number field. He just somehow observed this factorization and makes a calculation. Let me give a really quick example. Five minutes. In this case, OF equals to Z adjoint N. And you can trust me that in this case, gamma is, the minimal solution you see is 3 plus root of 10. <coughs> and the coefficient looks very small. And when you look, when the coefficient looks small, you, you're sure it's probably going to be the fundamental solution. That's, that's my spirit. <laughs> you can take norm of gamma. This is 9 minus 10. Next one. So it's a bit annoying, so you have to take the square of this. To get 19 plus 2, or excuse me, what am I writing? 6 root of 10. So, one of the solution is 19 and 6. And the rest are somehow more. If you want to get another solution, you have to do 19 plus 6 root of 10 square or cube. It goes down cube. How did I do this? For example, you get a very crazy solution. So therefore this and the x equals that and y equals that is a solution to the Pell's equation. Uh, two minus x squared minus ten y squared. 
So from a small solution, you can generate more and more general solutions. Okay. Are there questions about this? Yes. Uh, is the R that you have above the same R that comes from the number of embeddings? Oh, very good question. No, not the okay. Same. All right. So we can just pick that R to be whatever number we want. Yeah, whatever makes better sense. Want. Okay. I just wondered why we were cubing it if there was only. No, 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 no. There's no, there's no reason. Okay. I could do a square, but square sounds a little <laughs> too small. <laughs> nothing, nothing to it. Okay. So here's I I I this is some, something from Wikipedia I printed. Uh, it gives you a kind of the fundamental uh, solution to this Pell's equation, where I guess his n is by d, uh, and x y are the you know, x y. So see the numbers are kind of a very jumpy. It changes a lot. This is something I want to say that you know the, although the, like the the n could be very small, but the First fundamental, like the first unit, could be very complicated. Uh, the best way to get these fundamental units is by uh, by the methods of uh, continuous fractions. Uh, right, root of n as continuous fraction, and then you unwind the process. So yeah, so this is something I wanted to point out. The unit could be large. Uh, basically, it's not much time. So maybe. I'll just talk about one last thing about how to visualize these units, which might be interesting. Okay. How to visualize. Uh, so remember, like, in, uh, so I'll, I'll just do one example. Let's do f equals q or q equals 10. Can, can you move this down? Oh, yes. Thank you. It's not now. Thank you. Okay, about this. So in the past, when we talk about ideals, you know, I want to embed f into r squared, right? But now, if I actually do this for units, remember that O f cross is basically all the elements u and o, and the norm of u is plus or minus one, right? So that means that when I when I do the lattice in here, so what's the norm in this case? Well, if you have u equals x, uh, uh, x plus, uh, u equals x plus root of 10y, so unit really means x squared minus 10y squared equals 1 plus minus 1. So what is this? Uh, this looks like not quite a straight one, but sort of in this direction, it's a hyperbola. All the, all the units are lines on this hyperbola. So this is one unit, one, one. Remember, this one, one corresponds to the number one. And you have another. So this is where x squared minus 10. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, not x. Uh, sorry. The well, norm of this equals this. So what is the norm of an element? So this x and y represent two embeddings of it. Sorry, I was wrong. So there are two embeddings. So basically the norm in this case is x, y. Just, just somehow, because this is going to be, norm is just tau 1 of u, tau 2 of u. The way I coordinate my x and y's are, this is a first coordinate to the second coordinate. Okay? I'm really looking at really looking at a standard problem where x times y equals plus minus 1. This is x, y equals 1. This is x, y equals negative 1. And so this is number 1 here. And the next number is uh, 3 plus root of 10, I remember correctly. 
So the coordinate will be 3 plus root of 10 and 3 minus root of 10. So that's 3 plus root of 10 here. And 3 minus root of 10, root of 10 is like you know, uh, 3.16. So it's a little bit lower here. And then the next one will be kind of a further down here. So that would be 3 plus some squared. And so on. If you think about this, it's not very convenient to see what they are. I, mean, I know that they rely on these two problems. But a better way to, know, to visualize is to take the log. And now, if I take the log, the log coordinate, this is actually log of the x coordinate. I'm going to use, uh, just write it like this. So the new x and the new y. And what I'm saying is that log of 1, 1 is just really this point. So this is at this point. And what's a, where does this problem go? So the condition x, y equals 1 corresponds to log of x plus log of, plus of my, log of y equals to log of 1, which is 0. So on the log picture, Everything will lie on this anti-diagonal line. And this point here will be, uh, I think, will be x in the direction is a little bit longer, so it's going to be here, so it's going to be log of 3 plus root of 10, comma negative log 3 plus root of 10. That's the same as log of, so epsilon is 3 minus root of 10. And the next one is going to be equal distance, so it's the same distance. going to be point here and then go on here and same with another direction. So I just want to say that if you want to visualize OF cross, it actually lies on a actually hyperplane in this coordinate. And they form a lattice in this hyperplane. I'm doing this for this uh, case of a, a real quadratic field. But in general, OF cross will lie in some sort of r-dimensional space, but in fact it lies in some sort of hyperplane inside of here. And this becomes a lattice here. That's how you visualize a, a, the units. And you have some sort of lattice inside a hyperplane. And because you're talking about fundamental units, there's something called the regulator of the, uh, of the number field. That's also a, a, a important invariant of this number field. Uh, I guess I don't have much time to say. Things. But hopefully Keith will say a little bit in the next lecture. I don't know what he has in mind. If he, if he can say something, that's great. To, <laughs> how to relate these regulators and ideal class group with a special value of something, the alpha. The, 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 he talked about the original alpha. Right? And there's a generalization of Riemann data function for number field too. How to relate these numbers with some special value of that. A data, a generalization of data functions. Anyways, I'll end my lecture here, I guess. Uh...